This video assumes that you're already familiar with the principles of biomass, including sourcing and storing fuel and getting planning permission. If you're not, then you need to watch the introduction to biomass and the video on setting up a biomass project for an individual boiler first. District heating is not a new idea, and there are thousands of systems in the UK already. If you live in a block of flats, work in a hospital or went to a large boarding school, you may have already benefited from heat that was delivered by a district heating system. In such situations, there's very often a central boiler house or boiler room containing one or more boilers that run on coal, oil or gas. The district heating system consists of a highly insulated network of flow and return pipes buried in the ground. These are referred to as the heat main. Water is heated by the central boiler and travels along the flow pipes, distributing hot water past all buildings that might be connected. In each building that is connected, there will be some sort of heat exchanger, where the heat from the flow pipes is transferred to the water in the central heating system of that building. Once the heat has been extracted, the cooled water from the main then passes into the return pipe back to the boiler to be reheated. So far, so common. What's less common is the use of biomass to fuel the boilers at the centre of a system. But the principle of flow and return pipes connecting multiple buildings still applies. The only difference here is the type of boiler and the fuel source. Temperature measurement of the flow and return lines plus a flow meter together form a heat meter. This allows the actual heat usage within each building or even apartment to be separately measured. More modern systems, including biomass district heating systems, tend to use such a heat metering system as it means that each building or home can be accurately billed for the kilowatt hours of heat they've used. This is preferable to applying a flat rate charge where the total energy consumption is divided by the number of buildings supplied. This was the common method in old coal and oil systems and tends to encourage wasteful use of heat. One of the misconceptions about district heating is that there will be a central boiler somewhere which will be set to a certain temperature and you won't be able to control it in your house. This is not the case. The heating circuit within each building is isolated from the heat main. This means that each house connected can control their temperature independently. You'll need a consultant's help, whatever size system you're looking at. If you live in a development, such as large blocks of flats that are already connected to a single boiler, then swapping to biomass when the boiler is due for replacement may be reasonably straightforward. This is because the network of flow and return pipes will already be in place, and it's the installation of the pipework that can be by far the most costly part of the exercise. In such a case, therefore, you may only need the help of a boiler installer. In these situations, you'll need to investigate the potential to use the existing boiler room to house the biomass boiler. The space needed for a biomass boiler is not significantly different to coal or oil boilers, so in many cases, this will be feasible. Although, substantially more space will be required if you're replacing a gas boiler system. If your existing boiler is coal or oil, you'll also already have a coal store or oil tank, which may be a suitable location for the wood fuel store. It's likely to have to be enlarged, as wood chip takes up more space than either of these fuel types. If you don't already have a district heating system, then you'll need the help of a consultant or contractor who could also deal with the engineering works required to dig the trenches, lay and insulate the pipework and connect up each building to a heat exchanger and heat meter. This might sound like such a lot of work and it's hard to see how the economics can be feasible. Indeed, in some cases it won't be, especially if you are on mains gas already, which is quite cheap at present, or if you have very long pipes running between buildings. However, if your community isn't on the mains gas network and is therefore using oil, coal, bottled gas or mains electricity as your source of heating, it's likely that the high capital investment needed to change over to a district heating system will be repaid by the medium to long term savings. Electricity, bottled gas, coal and oil are already expensive and will become increasingly so as fossil fuel supplies decline. 
At larger scales, typically one megawatt and above, a combined heat and power, or CHP, biomass system could be installed. Such a system would typically be designed to burn wood chips to generate electricity. Generating electricity through burning fuel produces waste heat, which is obvious when you look at the cooling towers associated with power stations. Quite often, for every unit of electricity produced, as much as three units of heat is also produced. A biomass system that produces electricity, as well as being connected to a district heating network, provides a perfect opportunity to make use of this heat instead of wasting it. If your community contains a mix of homes, commercial properties and communal facilities such as leisure centres and schools, there may be potential for a combined heat and power system to be installed. This would generate electricity as well as heat for you and you should investigate this with your consultant. If the thought of owning and managing the boiler and pipework and sourcing and managing fuel deliveries is a bit overwhelming, you could consider entering into an agreement with an energy supply company. This is normally shortened to ESCO. If you use Nesco, the company who installs the boiler is responsible for the long-term maintenance, operation and fuel supply. You would therefore be entering into a contract to buy heat rather than all the bits of kit and the wood chips. In this case, properties connected to the system are simply billed for the energy at a price which reflects the costs of operating and maintaining the boiler, the paying back of the initial capital cost and the fuel supply cost, and of course, some profit margin for the operator but they still need to remain competitive in order to get the contracts. An ESCO contract feels more comfortable to many communities as they're then entering into an agreement for a service rather than having the responsibility for owning and managing equipment and fuel contracts themselves. ESCOs can be a good solution, but it is likely that you will have to pay more for the convenience in the long run and you need to check the terms of the deal to ensure that costs can't rise excessively in future years. Elsewhere in Europe, ESCOs are often run by cooperatives from the local community. For example, in Austria, there's a well-established protocol for introducing a district heating system into a village or district. Farmers form a cooperative to sell wood chips in the form of heat, and their cooperative installs, owns, and operates the district heating plant, operating as an ESCO. The biomass industry in the UK is woefully underdeveloped by comparison, but if you are an agricultural community that thinks that such a model could work for you, speak to the Forestry Commission in the first instance. Thank you for watching.